Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. And this week, up oh, step right here, I'll take your bags there, sir, <laughs> uh, because we are getting into the most haunted hotels in America. That's right. Uh, so in honor of us finally going on our honeymoon, uh, and also... Aside from that, sorry for the late episode this week. Uh, it is because we were literally on a plane coming back when we would be recording this. Yeah, because we've been on a beach mostly for the last week. Um, we were in a, we were, you know, hotel living for the past week. And mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, Carrie, everything was beautiful. My one complaint, no ghosts. Well, it was kind of a, a newish resort. Didn't feel very hauntable, I guess. But in honor of us traveling, finally outside of the East Coast for the first time since before COVID, I thought we'd tackle this fun roundup today of five of America's most haunted hotels. <laughs> hotels, inns, and other limited rental types of places are interesting because they're meant to be a home away from home when one is traveling. You could know the place you're visiting like the back of your hand, or it could be the first time you're visiting there. You could be a former resident of the town or city, or you may not even speak the native language. But, no matter what, where you lay your head at night, if not in a friend or a relative's home, is meant to be a place of comfort and safety, away from your normal surroundings. But sometimes these places have histories that are still quite alive, even in the present. And a hotel has some inherent creepiness also, right? Along with that, it's supposed to be homey, yeah, but it was homey for, like, someone else in the same bed yesterday. Yeah, hotels have this big liminal space feeling of just, like, these kind of long, empty hallways sometimes and weird, quiet spaces. And you go outside in the middle of the night and everything's bright, and but there's no one around. It's a very strange place and it's a very transitional place um as tighter uh, as writer tom ogden puts it in our main source material for this episode haunted hotels quote hotel rooms have been witness to passion hate misery joy life sickness and death it's easy to believe that some sort of residual energy from all those emotions has permeated the ether and lingers so Today, we're covering hotels from America, but don't be surprised if we branch out to more in the future, because after all, the history of America is comparatively young uh, when put against you know, the rest of the world. Look, there's John Belushi. Oh, that's later. Yeah, I know. <laughs> He's coming. I figured. <laughs> but we'll start a little closer to our own home and one hotel I visited, though have not stayed in. This is the Sagamore in Bolton Landing, New York. The Sagamore is located in the Adirondacks area, just outside of popular tourist destination Lake George. It touts itself as this sort of historic luxury, and that's kind of a good summation of the vibe. Is it expensive? Yes, that's why I've never stayed there. <laughs> It was originally built in 1883 and contains touches of Victorian architecture and sort of light opulence like marble accented bathrooms, the gorgeous views of Lake George, and its own 18-hole golf course. Ooh. I also know it's where Dave Matthews Band always stays when they play Saratoga Springs. Beautiful. And uh, yep, upstate New York is known for nothing if not its golf courses. And Dave Matthews Band. And Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> I do recall there being whisper, uh, whispers of it being haunted when we did stop by, most notably for a nice lunch in their outdoor area, but I didn't get to experience anything myself. However... Oh, you didn't go, let, let me in there, show me the ghosts. <laughs> I want to see the ghosts. I mean, I have done that before, but not in this case. Many others have experienced strange situations there, and in 2016, Today named it one of the 10 most haunted hotels in the country. According to both the books Haunted Hotels and the website Haunted History Trail of New York State, there are a handful or two of most prolific spirits haunting the SAG to this day. You can find the first just off of the hotel lobby area, and she's said to be a woman in her early 20s named Lillian, 
apparently dressed in the high fashion of her time, in a pinkish-brown dress with lace at the waist and a leg of mutton sleeves. Now, what does does that just mean the poofy sleeve at the shoulder? Yeah, I think it's the poof at the shoulder and then tight around the forearms to the wrists. Looking like a leg of mutton, I guess. Sure, I guess. There's not a lot of meat on that bone, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's said that she's still waiting for her friends so they could all go boating. You might find her passing time in the front office area, which used to be an open porch, looking down on Lake George. So if you see those legs of mutton, you know that it's a a ghost or something. <laughs> hey, baby, those mutton legs go all the way up. <laughs> A ghost named Walter is the next prolific ghost at the SAG. He's seen dressed in a three-piece brown suit and sporting a large and fancy walrus mustache. <laughs> Lots of that vibe. And he often materializes in the elevator nearest the concierge area. It's said he's either on his way to or returning from where the card y- room used to be, which, of course, he is. <laughs> yes, I say, I play some snooker. <laughs> and those are now the first floor guest rooms. He's apparently been spotted by many employees and usually leaves behind the telltale stink of many stogies enjoyed in the lounge. How do they know? So is Walter just a name they've bestowed on him or does he walk by and go, I'm Walter? <laughs> I don't know. I assume it's just the name they've given him because, you know, he's got a walrus mustache. Of course, his name is Walter. But uh, yeah, I think that's, I don't I don't know. All right. I like Walter's vibe. What else you got? <laughs> Another common ghost sighting was that of a married couple that seemed to be a remnant from the first decade or so that the hotel was in operation. Sometimes this couple would sit patiently in the hotel's restaurant reception area before completely disappearing, but other times they were seen to enter the dining room before breaking into a fight with the husband throwing the the wife down to the ground. So not as good vibes as Walter. Oh, and maybe a hint. Of their of their demise. Mm. Well, as she grabbed up to or reached up to grab him after this, the pair would simply fade away. These sightings became less as the area they were commonly seen in was converted to more first floor rooms, but it's felt that they're still lurking around along with Walter. Perhaps the most commonly seen spirit at the Sagamore is that of a young boy dressed in 1950s era clothing running around the 18-hole golf course. So he's got like a pack of cigarettes rolled up in his <laughs> sleeve and a leather jacket? No, I think like, he's- Hey, a- I'm on the golf course. <laughs> I think he's more of a, a kid look, probably like those long shorts but high socks kind of thing. A striped t-shirt of some kind. Yes. According to the legend surrounding his story, this child would earn spare change by finding lost golf balls and returning them to the hotel's pro shop. However, he was struck by a car one day after running out into the street after a ball and tragically killed. He's been on the course ever since and always enjoys causing mischief. It seems he will often snag a ball after it lands and hide behind a tree while the golfer searches for it until tossing it at their feet with a laugh. That's real dedication and also either like a bad golfer or a badly designed course, right? Why are you hitting it into the street? Well, there's only so much area, I guess. Uh, You know, it's it's prime lakefront property. Well, then build a nine hole. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Next, we'll visit the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado, notable for being the inspiration for Stephen King's The Shining and a location used in the 1997 miniseries adaptation of the novel. I'm shocked that this is haunted. Shocked. (laughs) Like the Sagamore, the Stanley also has what they call a spirited history. (laughs) Ha ha. It's like like ghosts. (laughs) Inventor Freeland Oscar Stanley, who you may know as one of the creators of the Stanley Steamer, tough on dirt, gentle on carpets. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I thought that was uh, some kind of a sexual act. (laughs) Uh, He arrived in the Estes Valley in 1903, suffering from the symptoms of tuberculosis, which was called consumption in his day. And he was seeking a place to recuperate and hopefully heal. He was stunned to find that just one season in this area was all that was needed to restore his health. And that was no small feat for tuberculosis in those days. So he kept returning to the valley. 
But it came at a terrible price. <laughs> Is there some other shoe that drops in this story? Um, I'm not sure about him, but later. He eventually opened the Stanley Hotel in the area in 1909, along with his wife, Flora, with the goal of bringing East Coast sophistication to Colorado. Much of the hoi polloi visited in the early days, including band leader John Philip Sousa, who tuned the hotel's piano himself, and Harry Houdini, our old friend from our Deadly Illusions episode. Yep, go back and listen to that. If you don't know about Harry Houdini's life, uh, it's fascinating, and we take at least a little a little quick tour through there. Mm-hmm. He performed his magic act at the hotel and left a trap door in its stage that it remains there to this day as a remnant of his act. It wasn't all fun and magic tricks, though. In 1911, an explosion in room 217 blew chambermaid Elizabeth Wilson clear through the floor with two broken ankles. What? Exploded? <laughs> okay, well, uh, at this time the hotel was powered by gas lighting, but the power had been lost during a severe storm. Yeah, sometimes I feel like this house is powered by gas lighting. Anyway, uh, Wilson entered the room to check on the lights, but she entered with a candle, so... Though she survived this accident, she what? died. <laughs> yeah, she survived two broken ankles, though. That's not from the, great. From hitting the floor? No, she was blown through the floor. No, I know. So when did she break her ankles? Like she landed Probably on landing on the... on the next floor down, Sean. So I'm just amazed she didn't... <laughs> no, you know, no horrible burns, no injuries from being blown through the floor, just the broken ankles. I mean, I'm sure there was other stuff, but those were the most egregious. She's very lucky, is what I say. <laughs> she survived. She died 40 years later of an aneurysm in the very same room. So many believe she still haunts the halls of the Stanley and room 217. Has she been, like, seen? Yep. Limping around on her two broken ankles? <laughs> I don't know if that's the specific part, but yes, people have seen her. As it goes on the Stanley website, quote, by the 1970s, the hotel's splendor had faded due to lack of care and investment. It might have eventually succumbed to the wrecking ball, if not for a fortuitous visit by author Stephen King. Now, King has spoken a lot about his one-night stay at the Stanley over the years, because everything about his writing has become mythology. Um, but this is the main story he's told. In 1974, he stayed overnight and had a horrific nightmare. Quote, I dreamt of my three-year-old son running through the corridors, looking back over his shoulder, eyes wide, screaming. He was being chased by a fire hose. I woke up with a tremendous jerk, sweating all over, within an inch of falling out of bed. I got up, lit a cigarette, sat in the chair, looking out the window at the Rockies, and by the time the cigarette was done, I had the bones of the book firmly set in my mind. A fire hose. Mm-hmm. And uh, this son was his son, Joe, uh, Joe Hill, who is now a horror author himself. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, he's the inspiration for The, the Shining. He has to be a horror author, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> part of the mythology. So thus, the terrifying Overlook Hotel and the character of Jack Torrance were born. The Stanley does have real ghosts, though. Wait, so that saved the hotel because just after The Shining, people started visiting it because they yes. knew the book was based on yes. it? And then I assume... I mean, that definitely helped. And then more after the movie, obviously. Mm -hmm. Even though the original movie was not filmed there. But it's obviously based on there visually. So this is one of the only hotels I've ever heard of to have its own in-house ghost tour. You can also specially book certain most haunted rooms, including 401, 407, 428, and, of course, 217. Uh, that's the one that had blown up and all that stuff. And that's also, coincidentally, the one King had booked the evening of his fortuitous nightmare. Did you read that they come as a at a premium? Like, I'm sure they do. The ghost rooms? I'm sure they do. I think I think 217 especially is like booked out for years. I you, want to write a <laughs> best-selling horror novel. <laughs> uh, they kind of recast it as room 237 in Kubrick's version of the Shining film. But guests state that in room 217, they'll sometimes find their belongings have been unpacked by unseen forces. 
Objects will move around on their own, and a woman's voice can be heard in the room during the night. The spirit of what people believe to be Elizabeth has, and that's the the woman who the blew through the floor. Made, yeah. <laughs> uh, she's even seen walking in the room and out right through a wall where the door used to be. And this is kind of something they figured out, an old blueprints. So it seems like the ghost is used to the old layout. You might also find the spirit of Lord Dunraven, <laughs> played by Vincent Price, of, of course. course. Uh, he originally owned the land in Estes Valley that the Stanley resides on, uh, in room 401. That's where he hangs out. This was once my land. <laughs> or you might find the ghost of a cowboy who likes to watch you sleeping in room 428. Well, yee You sure do look purty all supine there, partner. <laughs> Wandering the hotel outside of your sleeping quarters, you might ex- you might have experiences here too. Disembodied sounds of children running, playing, and laughing are often heard in the hallways without any source. <laughs> <laughs> Horrifying. The original Stanleys also seem to have never checked out of their pride and joy, with reports of Flora's piano playing during the dead of night and her being seen on the fourth floor, along with Freeland Stanley also having been captured in photos taken in the billiards room, which in life had been his favorite hangout spot. But none of them died there, right? That I'm not sure. I mean, I don't, you know, they might have. It was olden times. <laughs> <laughs> People were dropping dead all over the place. Uh, dying everywhere. If you'd like to visit the Stanley, give him a call and try to book room 217, and don't forget a ghost tour. You can even watch The Shining over and over and over again <laughs> on their in-house cable channel. And uh, you could even attend their year- yearly Halloween bash. Just make sure you eventually check out, you know, Alive. That sounds really cool. I unfortunately have plans every Halloween <laughs> until I die. <laughs> I wouldn't mind going there one Halloween. It's... It looks like a gorgeous place. They've definitely kept it in great shape. It just seems like a fun place to visit. And it's in a beautiful location, too. Next, we're going to hop back over to the East Coast with the Lizzie Borden House Bed and Breakfast in Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, Now, this is one you have stayed at. I have not stayed there. I have done a tour there. I I really want to stay there, though. So it is another hotel that has its own ghost tour. Well, it doesn't have specifically a ghost tour. They mention ghosts, but it's just a tour of the house. And it's like, oh, this is where that person was murdered. This is where that person was murdered. Great. You know, fun, casual stuff. But that's a good hint for where ghosts might (laughs) be seen. Sure. We're going to absolutely cover the Borden case in full detail on a later episode. But I'm going to give you the basics here. Don't want to give too many spoilers for all that fun sure to come. On August 4th, 1892, older couple Andrew and Abby Borden were found murdered in their home, the eponymous B&B, the victims of a horrific axe murder death. Andrew received 10 or 11 strikes to the head, and his wife Abby received 17 direct hits with an axe to the back of her head. Yeah. So it doesn't go quite like the, uh, the rhyme. Four, oh, four, yeah, 40 and 41 <laughs> yeah, was no. the breakdown there. Yeah, it seems exhausting. Um, scandal erupted at the possibility of Andrew's daughter and Abby's stepdaughter, Lizzie, having been the axe murderer herself. And again, I'm not going to spoil what transpired at Lizzie's court trial, but we're just going to say that the murder, the murderer was never officially caught. And uh, I will also say the Lizzie Borden in leans in in a fun way right oh like yeah they're i know we have a lizzie borden doll that you bought there right uh, with it's the very, a it's a bobblehead she's somewhere around here um, with the very demonic eyes and she's in like red morning garb and she, and she's wearing like a red and black dress and holding an axe uh you know whatever's good for business i guess <laughs> the borden house was eventually purchased and made into a bed and breakfast and museum And was recently sold again, which you may remember because we covered it in previous news segments on the show. And they're definitely going to be leaning into all the ghost stuff uh, with that new owner. The B&B has always 
flouted, I guess, its notorious past and possibly haunted present, and that earned it the number two spot on the list of the top ten most haunted hotels in the world by you, Switch. Mm. And uh, it's also on, like, basically every other list of most haunted American hotels. The house is said to have several resident spirits, including, of course, the murdered Andrew and Abby Borden. Is Lizzie in there, too? Yep. She she comes by when she isn't haunting Maplecroft, the house that she lived in after her trial. She um, she got all of Andrew's money, her and her sister, and uh, the two spinsters moved across town to this mansion, Maplecroft, and that's where they lived out the rest of their days. She never got married. Well, we'll get to the story another time. Yeah. And no, she didn't. The Ghost Adventures boys stayed the night at the B&B back in 2011, and it was, of course, an explosive experience for the crew. I mean, not as explosive as it was for Elizabeth <laughs> at the Stanley, but still. Let's, uh, let's see what happened there. One for yes, two for no. There's one that just said yes. Okay, so are you the killer of the Bordens? Did you kill... Andrew and Abby Borden. One for yes, two for no. One for yes. There's one for yes. Are you a male or a female spirit? Once for a male, twice for a female. Stop it. Stop. Stop. Wait till I ask a question. Are you evil? Once for yes, two for no. Are you a little child? Did your mother murder you? <laughs> Are you? Wait till I ask you a, a question, like a civilized person. Are you evil? Yes or no? <laughs> uh, yeah. So they they did a lot of stuff there, and later on, the crew has a séance. I do. I, I. By the way, I love with those little electromagnetic beeping boxes. Mm-hmm. You just leave it running and keep talking to it for a while, and eventually it like stops after you say stop or whatever. Mm-hmm. Pretty compelling. Yeah, sure. Can you tell me who attacks people here? Lizzie. Did you hear that? It goes, Lizzie. Can you tell me who attacks people here? Lizzie. I think it might have said Liz O. Well. I do my head toss and check my nails. Yeah, you're not going to be feeling good as hell when Lizzo kills you with an axe. So, seems like the ghosts are saying that Lizzie got away with the double homicide. What? When did they say that? He said, who killed you? And- Lizzie. Lizzie. Yeah, but earlier there was- He said Lizzie. Earlier there was one- bi- First of all, we know that it said Lizzo. <laughs> And second, uh, earlier the ghost said it was male. But he was fool- uh, the ghost was fooling around. Also, it could have been the ghost of Andrew Borden, who was one of the victims. Hello. All right. Do we have any more clips of Zach scolding <laughs> spirits? <laughs> Not for there. Um, the Borden family themselves weren't new to murder, however, shockingly enough. In 1848, Andrew's uncle's family was living next door, and his wife Eliza Borden apparently lost her mind and drowned both of their young children in the well out back. Uh, Not good. Not great. After killing her children, the murderous mother slit her own throat. This is not a great family. No. Because of this, some think that there's a darker force at work that may have possessed both Lizzie and her great-aunt Eliza to commit their dark deeds. At least that's the conclusion that the special The Curse of Lizzie Borden comes to, which you can find on Discovery+. Plus. Oh, and I will. (laughs) So maybe if you decide to stay the night at the Borden home, or even nearby, I guess, you should protect yourself against evil entities and what they might have you do. How? Um, you know, just, uh, sage and stuff. Carry around a Morton salt (laughs) can, just constantly circles around Mm -hmm. yourself. Uh, random weird story. I went to a church sale in our town a couple years ago, and I picked up two, two of these small boxes of 
I thought they were maybe old postcards or something, but it seemed to be this woman's collection of art, uh, like art advertisements that you used to find on everything. Back then, everything was like hand painted. And, you know, you'd get basically an ad in the mail or a handout for thread or something, but it would have like that kind of old fashioned postcardy look to it. With this also with the Christmas cards with the ducks on them. There and were stuff? some, yeah, some Christmas cards because back in the day, the, these were all from about 1890 to 1910. That was the timing that these were from. Um, back in the day, they didn't really have a look for Christmas yet. Yeah, Santa with the red suit and stuff. Coca Cola made that up in the 30s, I think. Yeah, I mean there there have been mentions of it. It was you know twas the night before Christmas really brought it together. But yeah, visually. Coca-Cola really pushed that image. So they hadn't figured out Christmas yet. I have one of the the pieces that's like these kids riding a cricket like through <laughs> yes. the snow. It's the most springtime. Like a giant cricket. It's like springtime is breaking through the, the it's snow. It's bizarre, yeah. But in this box, I found all of these little booklets for basically like, I think it was high school alumni nights you know, like class reunions, but from the 1890s and early 1900s. And on this list, I saw that this school was in Fall River, Massachusetts, which I knew as the home of Lizzie Borden, and an attendee or a speaker or whatever on multiple of these booklets was Spencer Borden. And I'm pretty sure he's related to Lizzie. I'm pretty sure he's like an uncle or something. Wow. Wow. Or some sort of cousin. So it was weird finding this stuff that, I mean, she was alive at this time. This is near when the murders happened. So it's just kind of crazy because, I mean, I, I doubt there were any other Bordens in town that weren't related to them. But I'm pretty sure I tried to look it up. And I, I think Spencer was some sort of relative. Maybe not a blood relative, but. It's like a real tangible connection to that time and place. If a Kevin bacon -y one. Yeah, and it was also weird to find this stuff in Connecticut because this was Massachusetts. So, I mean, you know, history's all around you. And that, that was definitely a weird little moment, uh, my little Lizzie Borden discovery. So we're going to talk about two more haunted hotels after the break. Ooh. Do you have what it takes to go into the mind of a serial killer? or solve a horrific case. <laughs> Hi, everybody. When you join Hunt a Killer, you receive a box full of cryptic clues mailed to you each month to test your detective skills and challenge even the most brilliant minds in a game designed to give you a journey into the mind of a killer so you can escape with the answers you need. And I hope you do escape. Input our code Scary Squad twenty for twenty percent off when you sign up for your first subscription box at huntakiller dot com, and find out if you have the guts to hunt a killer. The guts. That's the code Scary Squad twenty S C A R Y S Q U A D two zero for two zero percent off at huntakiller dot com. www dot huntakiller dot com. Hunt a killer. Join the hunt today. Welcome back. When last we left you, we were three down and two to go in our tour of the hauntedest, hauntedest? Most haunted. Most haunted hotels <laughs> in America. And uh, we just hit the Lizzie Borden house up in Massachusetts. And uh, where's our next stop, Carrie, on this uh, ghoulish road trip? Yeah, we hit that house like a... Crazed mad woman with an axe. Well, she would be hitting like a skull. Yes. It's a metaphor. Okay. The next one is the 1886 Crescent Hotel and Spa in Eureka Springs, Kansas. Oh, it has a spa. Now, this sounds relaxing. <laughs> well, it is another hotel that, like the Stanley and somewhat the Borden B&B, &B, leans into its ghostly history. Uh, I would say it's most like the Stanley because it's really into this stuff. It also offers its own on-site ghost tour. And you can find the information for that at 
America's Most Haunted Hotel.com. Oh, they're putting on airs now. <laughs> well, it is a domain that they own and run. It's linked from their main page, so it's not just a fan site or whatever. Well, just because you own the domain doesn't make it true, though. Or, yeah. No, but they're, what I'm saying is they're leaning into it. They're touting their haunted history. Sure. Um, they even have a yearly paranormal weekend, and it seems like there's a couple of these coming up in January or February of next year. What do you think that consists of? I know it's a, it's like basically a convention, but they also do ghost tours and ghost hunts while they're there. A lot of speakers doing stuff. And the website also collects basically all the stories of sightings and everything. It's really interesting. You should see if you can get us a table. <laughs> yeah, you want to go to Arkansas in February? Uh, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. The Crescent was originally built in, you guessed it, 1886, as at the time, uh, it was America's most luxurious resort hotel. Along with being a resort, the hotel has also served as a girls' college and a cancer hospital, so the space has seen its fair share of lives and deaths. Huh. <laughs> <It's> my- <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, a grim reaction to the reality of death. Yeah. It comes for us all, Carrie. <laughs> well, you know. Some of the purported spirits, according to America's Most Haunted Hotel.com, are <laughs> as follows Michael, an Irish stonemason, is said to haunt room 218, where he fell to his death when building the hotel. Okay. So now I, I like the ones better when we have a connection to the person who died. Like, th- this sure. is a person who actually died when the hotel was being built, or maybe did. You know, like the Disney ones, uh, they were all connected to, like, a specific uh, horrific incident. Yeah, and there's, um, we were just in Stowe, Vermont, and was it the Stowe Inn? It was right in town. There was also, like, a, a guy who fell out of a window trying to help a kid or that's something right. yeah. on that hotel. So that's supposed to be haunted, too. Uh, Another ghost at the Crescent is Theodora, a former cancer patient. Dear Theodora, what to say to you? Well. You are a ghost. You are You died of cancer. You died. Oh, I don't want to sing about (laughs) this Theodora anymore. Yeah. She's been seen fumbling for her keys outside room 419, as well as tidying up for guests when they leave the room. So that's very kind of her. A four-year-old child named Brecky Thompson died in the hotel due to complications from appendicitis, and he's been seen throughout the area, often bouncing a little ball. That's just, that's, for a little kid to die of appendicitis, that's negligence on the parents' part, right? That's scary. Uh, I mean, scary though, because kids are, kids are crying about stuff all the time. Yeah. You don't know if they're really hurt or they just want some ice cream. I don't know. If, I don't think your tummy hurts that bad. And then he's dead. Yeah. People listen to your kids. <laughs> um, there's a Dr. John Fremont Ellis. He was the hotel's in-house doctor circa the late 19th century. Oh, did he let that kid die of appendicitis? <laughs> I don't know. He's often seen or smelled via his cherry pipe tobacco uh, near his former office, which is now room 212. Well, it's a little more pleasant than the Stogies, probably, at that uh, hotel in the last segment. Probably. Uh, And most adorably, Morris, the famed hotel cat, who was known as the hotel general manager for 21 years. (laughs) Uh, It's like how sometimes a very small Iowa town will, like, elect a cat mayor. Exactly. Yeah. He was the general manager. I mean, he put in 21 years of work. He deserves a pension at the very least. He passed away and was later buried on the hotel property. This little kitty is regularly seen and heard all around the hotel grounds. I've got news for you. Cats can be heard almost every, <laughs> almost everywhere. Maybe it's the same exact one that's in the picture. I don't know. Yeah, but well, at the resort we were at uh, in Jamaica this past week. Well, those were stray Jamaican cats, and they were all from one baby daddy, I My think, because is... they all had striped tails very specifically. Exactly. Well, so... They didn't all look the same. They looked very different, but the tail was the same on all of them. Yeah, they had like raccoon stripes on them. I think people are just seeing a cat that looks kind (laughs) of similar to this other cat. That's what I'm saying. Well, 
But I love an animal ghost. You know how I feel about the Grey Friars, Bobby. I know. So this is Morris, and he's sweet. Okay, Sean? All right. Everybody check out our Haunted Cemeteries episode if you want a real animal ghost. Wow. You're just a Grey Friars, Bobby... Head. A stan. Head. <laughs> you are a stan. He's, uh, he's, you know, he's the best boy. Obviously. Except for Peanut. <laughs> Caroline. <laughs> Obviously. Some feel that due to the hotel being built on Crescent Mountain, which is made mainly of limestone, it might be a coalescing place for paranormal energy. Many people in the paranormal community believe that... Wait, because li- of the limestone? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm you're about tell to me. explain it. <laughs> Jeez. The li- they think that limestone has the ability to absorb and release electromagnetic and paranormal energies. Based on anything? Well, I assume you can probably chart electromagnetic energy in this way. You know, what stone is most electromagnetic? I mean, you can do that scientifically. Yeah, it's iron. It just, it is iron, I think. Okay, but this is limestone. Okay. Okay. And apparently it's very electromagnetic. It's not even metallic. And a lot of the, uh, at least the foundation for the the hotel, if not the main hotel itself, was made out of this limestone. So yeah. it's a limestone-y place. Okay, let me see if limestone even conducts electricity. There's a th- there's a, a book on Amazon that I did not read called like Limestone and the Spirit World or something, or Limestone and the Paranormal, and it's all about limestone uh, being a conductor of spiritual activity. All right, I do have an article in Chemistry World here that says limestone is an efficient energy distributor. Yeah, so it depends on how, what you believe spirits are yeah chemists in germany have said limestone batteries could be the key to transporting energy across huge distances like the veil yes like across (laughs) the veil into the next plane of course (laughs) listen so i'm personally am one who kind of believes that uh, spirits are energy i don't know if it's an actual ghost of a person a trapped soul or if it's just a residual energy from a life but, um, you know, if there's a stone that is, is good at absorbing and conducting energy, maybe it's more ghosty that way. I mean, that's why all these ghost hunting teams have EMF meters, these electromagnetic sensors, because they feel that that's paranormal energy. Okay, this is what's going to actually happen with this limestone thing. <sighs> this is about using sunlight to melt limestone. And releasing some some gases, some CO2. Um, well, that's not what they're doing here, Sean. Okay. I don't think limestone conducts electricity, so I don't think it's magnetic. I think this is just bullshit. Okay. But like on the face of it, it's not like not I'm like just, the normal I'm ghost just stuff. relaying to you what people in the paranormal community have said. Okay, all I'm okay. So I guess what I'm coming down to is this, listeners. If if you can shed light for me on the limestone, connection. well, maybe buy that Amazon book, Limestone oh, and the Paranormal. I'm not going to be doing that, <laughs> but I'll do a Google. I'll do a half-hearted <laughs> Google after this. That's about my level of interest. Okay. Listeners, get at me. Save me a half-hearted Google. Well, Sean, if you don't believe that, maybe it's the people that have stayed and worked in the hotel that really made it as haunted as they claim. Dr. Norman Baker was basically a quack who worked in the building when it was a cancer hospital, claiming he had a cure for, well, cancer. He went to the right place. (laughs) Yeah, uh, and that, that didn't really work out. We still don't have a cure for cancer, so he was lying to everyone. Shoot. In 2019, archaeologists uncovered Baker's bottle grave buried behind the hotel. This bottle grave, as they called it. Meaning where he dumped his, like, bottles of... What? Uh, Tell me. (laughs) I'm about to. It is full of bottles of Baker's secret cure formula, as well as preserved medical specimens like tumors and tissue that he surgically removed from patients and kept... And I guess eventually buried? Why? Why any of it? Uh, He sounds like a freak. Yeah. He kind of reminds me of the doctor ghost guy from the first season of American Horror Story, who is the one who supposedly killed the Black Dahlia. Just kind of this twisted guy who has a lot of specimens around. Also kind of reminds me of a Count Von Kosel saying that he has the, the cure for this, but he really doesn't. Right, yeah. 
Yeah, he was. It was he a one time that though because he was in love with this. Woman? One time was enough for uh, Carl Tanzler. Yeah. Check out uh, episode nineteen for more on him, or don't if you have a uh, weak stomach. Weak stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so since those bottles and everything were uncovered, the ghost, the hotel's ghost tour claims. There's been an uptick in activity, especially in the area of the morgue, which I assume used to be a morgue and is not currently. Uh, and dark figures have been spotted and people have reported cold spots and being touched, obviously, by things they cannot see. Cold spots make sense to me in a morgue. You shouldn't keep it too warm. I, I, I don't think it's a functioning morgue. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's a room that that they preserved in some way, which is appropriate for a morgue, or um, it just used to be the morgue, but that's what they said. Fair enough. Our last haunted hotel today is the Chateau Marmont in Los Angeles, California. Oh, we are getting to Belushi. I told you we were. Or does Lindsay Lohan's future spirit already haunt it? That's very dark, Sean. <laughs> that's very dark. We discussed the very haunted Roosevelt Hotel. It's also out of date, right? Yeah, and dark. It's like 10 years out of date. Anyway, go ahead. We discussed the very haunted Roosevelt Hotel nearby in Hollywood on our Haunted Hollywood episode, but the Chateau Marmont may just have as many ghosts, including those of the famous and infamous. But we're mostly going to talk about the famous. Yeah, because River Phoenix maybe died there too? No. He died at the Viper Room. Yes, you're right. Uh, nightclub. Wrong again, Sean. It's my middle name. <laughs> Sean W. McCabe. Sean Wrong McCabe. The Chateau Marmont was constructed in 1929 as the film industry in the area was really picking up steam. It's still in operation today as a hotel. And by the way, there it did a lot of shit around covid where it wasn't doing the right stuff and insurance was bad and there was it was in the news a lot about their covid precautions and not taking any so they were looking to create some more ghosts they knew what they <laughs> they knew where their bread is buttered there was an announcement in 2020 that it would be converting to a members only model where you could get some sort of timeshare but until and it, everybody has to wear a jacket with <laughs> those little snaps at the neck absolutely Till then, you can stay there in one of its rooms or bungalows, but don't be surprised if you end up with a spectral roommate. The most famous of the Chateau spirits is probably that of... John Belushi. John Belushi. He died in Bungalow 3 in 1982 of a heroin and cocaine overdose at just 33 years old. Jeez. I think it was a speedball. Yeah, that's heroin and cocaine. Yeah. Just brutal. Belushi, as you probably know, was a comedy superstar at the time, having burst onto the scene in the first years of Saturday Night Live and continued his career with hits like Animal House and a film that I think is probably one of the most perfect comedies of all time, even though it was made by a murderer, The Blues Brothers. Yes. Right up there with Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It just knows exactly what it wants to be. <laughs> Many have claimed to see Belushi's spirit at the Marmont, especially in and around Bungalow 3. One of the stories actually comes from Al Franken, who had written for SNL and was personal friends with Belushi himself. Franken stayed at Bungalow number 3 just a week after Belushi's death, which would have been a morbid enough experience, I would think. That's uh, it's pretty tough in a room where, where a, f a close friend died? A week ago. No, thank you. I would I would say maybe bum bungalow four this time. How about that? In the <laughs> just middle, one, just one over. Just you know, I'll, I'll, if I want to be around it, I'll be around it. I don't need to be in it, you know. In the middle of the night, he woke up from a restless sleep to see the apparition of none other than John Belushi standing over him. Okay. Of course, he'd recognize him because a he was a superstar and b he's a personal friend. He called out to his deceased friend, but by the time Franken got his glasses on, he was like, oh, <laughs> you know, just imagine him fumbling for the glasses like he can't believe this. Uh, by the time he got them on, Belushi had vanished. This is a, is, you know, a dream, a grief uh, uh, apparition. And, and Al Franken knows that. He said it was a spirit. And he believed it was his ghost. And hey, if Belushi's going to appear to anyone, why not his friend? 
a week after his death. Ugh. Well, heroin is going to slow you down a little bit. Maybe he hadn't gotten out of there yet. <sighs> Jeez. Well, it seems like he's probably still in there because another Belushi sighting was reported in 1999 when a family temporarily moved into the notorious bungalow while their home was being renovated. During their stay, they often found their young son laughing and giggling by himself, which is always very fun. <laughs> Just a two-year-old giggling in a corner, facing the corner. Isn't that your childhood? Listen, I was an only child. <laughs> I didn't have anyone to talk to. Uh, my parents uh, had a baby monitor in my room while I was a toddler, and they ended up just having to remove it entirely because I would talk myself to sleep. Uh-huh. You, uh, now I just talk you to sleep, I guess. Oh, y- you sure do. <laughs> Even when you're not in bed. Yep. <laughs> when asked what was so amusing, uh, the little boy would respond, The funny man. Ugh. When his mother leafed through a book of the chateau's past celebrity guests, I assume some sort of coffee table book, the child stopped her at a photo of John Belushi and pointed it out, saying, That's the funny man. So it seems like the ghost of John Belushi was entertaining this little kid. Do you think it's possible the mom was like, Is this the funny man? No, it, the story said that he stopped and pointed it out and said, That's the funny man. Stop me when you get to the funny man on this page. <laughs> Is this the funny man? Is this the funny man? Is this the funny man? All right, pick the funny man. <laughs> Enter, please. All right, from left to right, we're going to go through. You tell me which one's the funny man. <laughs> Belushi wasn't the only celebrity to die tragically at the Chateau, however. In 2004, famous photographer Helmut Newton was driving on Marmont Lane from the hotel to Sunset Boulevard when he suffered a fatal heart attack behind the wheel, causing him to lose control of the car and crash into the wall of the driveway. Just a free heart attack? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're usually surprises. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> But like to incapacitate him so quickly. It was, yeah, it, was, it probably would have been fatal. And then he crashed the car. He was pronounced dead soon after. Several long-term guests of the Chateau have stated they've seen a man who they say looks strikingly like Newton had in life, wandering around by the bungalows looking dazed. And sometimes this apparition is also bleeding. Others have heard the phantom clicks of a camera by the pool, but have seen no culprit. And I assume this is, you know, one of those manual cameras. So perhaps it was Newton's spirit taking pleasure in his photography, just like he had in life. Or a paparazzi in a bush, but (laughs) maybe it's Helmut Newton. So that's it for today. Uh, That's five so far. Sean, have you ever stayed in a hotel that claimed to be haunted? Yes, there was specifically one uh, we stayed at in Ireland. They didn't charge you extra for the haunted room because, in fact, on their hotel tour, they did have a tour because it was was an old, like... But it was, like, more of a history tour, not a ghost tour specifically. Yes, because it had been, like, a private castle built by some rich guy, you know. I mean, yeah, those those are every five feet in Ireland. Yeah, exactly. Um... They're all from, like, after the era of castles, by the way, too. They're all just, like, rich guys who Mm. wanted their private homes to look like Mm -hmm. medieval castles. Sure. Um, So, anyway, it's one of those, and they were we were on the tour, and they were like, and this is the room where they say, uh, guests will sometimes say they've seen her. And uh, my aunt was already checked into that room, (laughs) and, like, someone had to, on the trip, had to switch with her, because she was, like, she was terrified of this uh, uh, apparition. If I'm remembering correctly, it could have been that my mom was in the room with the ghost. And had forced someone else to take her spot. No, she or would never. It might in. be. The, it, might, it could be that she transferred in. Yeah, I can't imagine your mom being like, "I'm scared of a possibility of a ghost." I don't. <laughs> I think if she, I think if your mom encountered a ghost, she'd be like, "Get out of here! <laughs> what are you doing here?" <laughs> just, just be like annoyed, somewhat flummoxed a little. And why shouldn't she be? <laughs> she paid for the room. Yeah, my mom experienced a couple of things at places that she didn't know were haunted before she stayed there because she probably wouldn't have stayed there because my mom's a big weenie. Love you, mom. <laughs> um, I didn't inherit that from her, clearly. So maybe I'll get her to give some of those stories to me and then I'll I'll say I'm on the next episode. But um, we recently, you and me, stayed at the... 
at the Hawthorne Hotel in Salem. Yep, allegedly haunted. Yeah, that's on a lot of these lists. I didn't want to go into it too much because we just did the Salem Witch Trials episode. But that's another one where it's always a stop on a ghost tour and they have... I don't think they have an official tour there, but like, you know, someone will show you the most haunted rooms and there are specific haunted rooms that are supposed to be the most haunted and you can try and book those. Yeah. Our room was not haunted um, at the Hawthorne. Just kind of narrow. Yeah, it was narrow, but it was it was on like a corner or something. So some nice window views. Yeah, the room was entirely filled with a very comfortable bed. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very cool looking place. The lobby's kind of old school. It looks like uh, Tower of Terror <laughs> a little bit. Um, that might be the only... There's places I've wanted to stay. I've wanted to stay at the Lizzie Borden B&B forever. I'm trying to think if there are any other ones that I knew were haunted. Our listeners might be surprised to know we didn't... <laughs> Go try to book a uh, a haunted hotel for our honeymoon. But, <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to find a haunted all inclusive resort. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's not really a thing. It's like, true. Oh, it's the ghost of the ten daiquiris you drank yesterday. I brought you your pina colada. <laughs> it's sir. like you're frightening, but thank you. Um, but I would love to. I would love to stay in more. I want to stay in all the haunted hotels. Kind of like the guy in 1408 who then goes crazy. But then I don't want to go crazy. You just have to hope that there's no real ghosts then. And then you're just depressed like he was before he got to that <sighs> hotel room. I That's think he's... Tough. John Cusack's better off at the end of that movie. Hmm. Well, anyway. We'll let you know the next time we we stay at a haunted anywhere and, uh, and report back on our experiences. Uh, 1408 is slept on. Because it's a latter day John Cusack movie. Listen, it, it's one of hey. ten thousand. Hold on, it's one of ten thousand Samuel L. Jackson movies. <laughs> uh, it's one of a million Stephen King adaptations. The balance of which are bad. Mm-hmm. Um, fourteen oh eight's really good and creepy. It's good and, and awesome. I will not take John Cusack's slander. I think he's doing something with his career now that's much like Nicolas Cage, where he just takes any job. Um, but I, I always enjoy them. If you like John Cusack and you like weird spooky things, watch The Raven, which I'm the only person that's ever seen it. Um, yeah, I remember it looked crazy and terrible. It's not actually, it's, it's actually pretty fun. Um, it's got him, it's got Luke Evans. That's the one where Edgar Allan Poe is John Cusack solving a murder? John Cusack is Edgar Allan Poe, and there is a murderer on the loose um, committing murders that are similar to Poe's stories. So, of course, I friggin' loved it, but it was very fun. Um, it sounds like, like, I, I will watch it with you, and I will, it's either going to be so contrived, like, all the things are going to be too contrived, and I'll hate it. <laughs> I mean, or, you got it. It's fun. Seeing someone about to be murdered it pit in the pendulum style is, is very fun. A lot of people being buried alive. It's fun. Go see it. Want to treat your pup to something special? When you visit www.barkbox.com slash scary, you can receive a free month added to your plan when you sign up for a 6 or 12 month subscription. That's an extra month of two fun toys, two full-size bags of treats, and a tasty chew at no additional cost. Recent box themes have included Home Alone, Liquor Treat, and A Night at the Squeakeasy. Poe loves trying out new toys and treats, and he was psyched to get a bark box. Your pup will be too. So sign up at www.barkbox.com slash ain't it scary for a free month added to any six or 12 month subscription. That's barkbox.com slash A-I-N-T-I-T-S-C-A-R-Y. Give your furry friends something to bark about. <laughs> It's true crime time. On November 15th, Alex Jones, famous conspiracy theorist and all-around chilly addle douchebag, was finally found liable for defamation in a suit brought by families of some of the 26 victims in the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre in Newtown, Connecticut. You think just chili does that to people? I need to change my burger and stand breakfast sandwich ordering if chili does that to people. You don't know the chili thing with Alex Jones? 
No, I, I do. I just think there's some, some other <laughs> stuff in the mix. Yeah, it's a chili. <laughs> you got a chili going, man. The suit, as filed against Jones in Connecticut in 2019, states that on his radio show and his website, InfoWars, Jones had repeatedly insisted that the families who lost loved ones during the mass shooting, and mostly these were children who died, uh, these families were actors who faked the deaths of their relatives. Jones continued to push this conspiracy theory through last year. This conspiracy, much like that of the Boston Marathon bombing, claims that these events were a false flag operation created by the government to assist in the removal of American constitutional rights. In this case, the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. Um, so basically, if there was enough outrage by all these children getting killed, it would make the government um, more easily able to take away our guns, because that makes sense. You can bankrupt Alex Jones, but unfortunately, you will never make Alex Jones go away. According to Jones, this false flag included many actors who pretended to be the devastated parents and family members of the victims, and some insisted the victims never existed at all. That it was all fake. Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut told MSNBC, quote, these families have been victimized over and over again, first by losing their loved ones, and second by having to deal with the terror of a conspiracy theory movement that thinks they are all actors, thinks they are all politically motivated, thinks this was all done as a stage act to try and promote a political agenda in Washington. I was a video editor for a local news station in Connecticut the morning that thing happened. I remember it happening. Uh, I, I know some of the parents a little bit. I've talked to them about this. I've mm -hmm. seen them, you know, even now years, almost a decade after the thing, well up talking about it. Um, it, it was super real to state the obvious. Yeah. I mean, there are such a thing as false flag operations. Uh, I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, there are even legitimate governmental conspiracies that have proof to back them up. This is not one of them. Followers of the conspiracy and of Alex Jones have harassed the families of the Sandy Hook victims, including victim Noah Posner's father, Leonard, having to move multiple times due to death threats, with one devotee of Jones and Ivo Wars being sentenced to five months in prison for sending messages to Posner like, death is coming to you real soon. This is all because of, like, NRA people. I mean, not, I'm not saying the NRA organization specifically, but, like, gun people. Uh, and because they're afraid that because of mass shootings, uh, there's going to be stricter gun laws because there probably should be. Um, it's so weird that they latched onto just the, like, fine, you can latch onto this one and say this is a false flag operation, but like there's mass shootings. Oh, they there, happen every day. There are other ones that they. I mean, I'm pretty sure there are thing. There are many conspiracies around Columbine. Like I said, but said they were around Boston bombing because of the state of um, what's it, martial law that was going on at the time when they were trying to find the brothers. Yeah, but these things happen like there's just not enough Alex Joneses to cover all of them. No, but this is definitely one that was latched on. Um, Maybe because maybe because it's one of the best reasons for. It's just one of the most horrific things. I mean, you can imagine exactly. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it is some of the best reasons for like, hey, maybe we shouldn't have AR-15s around and stuff. And because it's a compelling reason, because these are all children, uh, mostly, that were brutally killed by a legally purchased weapon. Maybe it's easier to believe that it was all fake. You know, because then, then all these children weren't murdered, but they were, so. All right, cheerful news segment. <laughs> well, um, Jones admitted in his deposition that the shooting really did occur, despite what he called a form of psychosis, where he had believed for a while that everything was sa staged. So he admitted that it was true, but he hadn't always believed it was true because he had a form of psychosis. If... This is what he swore yeah, well, under oath. He's probably lying, but if he's not... I mean, we talk about folie à deux, 
right? Uh, well, I think he's just lying. I of don't course. think he had any psychosis about it. I of think it, it got big ratings and big shares and all that stuff because it's a big, crazy conspiracy. Of course. But, well, I assume that's all Alex Jones is ever doing. Yeah. Um, you also wonder how much, since he's put himself in this echo chamber where all, there's all these crazies uh, who celebrate him for saying you know the craziest uh, uh, stuff, how much of that worldview does leak in to Alex Jones kind of backwash it's like Joe Rogan. How much does Joe Joe Rogan mm-hmm. get backwash of the crazy? That's true. Said Senator Murphy, I'm glad that at least today, several families from Sandy Hook have their day in court and have been able to reach some justice. So we'll see how much Jones will end up paying out to the families. But I am glad, like Murphy said, that they've seen some justice in this regard. Like we both just mentioned, this horrible shooting happened just a few towns away from us it was a very personal experience sean has dealt with it <laughs> almost firsthand i mean i don't know how you you went through I, doing I that, the news I wouldn't that say day that. Those people well are, you know. well doing the news that day i can't imagine doing that and um my dad was a teacher at the time a couple towns away it could have literally been his school you know We've both seen firsthand the absolute devastation and trauma it's caused to this whole area. And to claim it's all a fraud uh, would be laughable if it weren't so incredibly offensive. So I hope he has to pay them a lot of money. Yeah, but unfortunately, he's probably going to be fine. The Internet's not going anywhere. It's true. Um, But still, it was nice that he had to admit that he was lying. (laughs) Yeah, next week he'll be screaming again about something else. And just to, just to go over the chili thing, um, in his deposition about, I think, his his custody battle over his children, he said that he couldn't remember certain major facts about them because he had a big bowl of chili for lunch. Yeah, that's like... Uh, Hulk- he said that in court. It's like the, uh, the Hulk Hogan uh, sex tape where he's like, I shouldn't have had all that shrimp, brother. <laughs> that's uh, his performance excuse. Um, so, yeah. I hope Alex Jones just keeps on eating chili till he can't speak anymore. Um, yeah. We encourage our listeners not to watch him, and uh, um, for God's sakes, don't watch that Hulk Hogan sex tape. Oh, God. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary, and check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five star review on Apple podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. Yep. Special thanks as always to our top tier patrons, Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. We love you guys. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. This has been a production of Longboy Media. Ah!